Welcome. So we are going to be talking about the Phillips curve. So uh, we're getting away from that like mathy stuff and we're getting back into like real economics. So we had that quick detour and now it's back in to discuss uh, like real economic stuff. Yay. Um, so mostly what we've talked about so far are situations where the classical dichotomy and monetary neutrality hold. Um, but like, what about when these guys don't hold? So what if there's situations where, say there's an increase in the money supply and it has some real economic effect. And as that effect transmits to the economy, you see increases in the rate of inflation as the real effects eventually subside. This is actually really going, all right, well, we saw those impulse response functions in the last lecture. We learned about that. We're like, okay, hey, that's cool. It's, you know, we get to look at graphs and all that stuff and use real world data looking at it. So that's like super cool. But that doesn't really line up with what we learned about, like the, the quantity theory of money, for example. When we learned about that, um, that was saying really like, you know, there was really a lot of situations where monetary neutrality held, where changes in the money supply wouldn't be affecting output. Um, but when that doesn't hold, then what? Um, so, you know, I guess technically there's nothing that goes against monetary neutrality or the classical dichotomy, but um, maybe what we're really doing is addressing the short to medium term stuff instead of that medium to long term. So, and this is that classical dichotomy thing. So in the classical dichotomy, the idea is that you can have um, things, basically shit happens in the short run and not the long run. So you could have something like a monetary intervention in the short run that would have real economic effects. And in the long run, it wouldn't have real economic effects. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So what is the Phillips curve? Um, well... In 1958, William Phillips, who's an economist, uh, got a pretty interesting statistical find, and he found that there was a trade-off between wage inflation and unemployment, and he found there was a negative relationship between wage inflation and unemployment. So periods of low unemployment were associated with higher wage inflation. Periods of high unemployment were associated with lower wage inflation, and the idea was that a falling unemployment rate could increase labor demand, puts upward pressure on wages, and as such, profit-maximizing firms would be raising the prices of their products in response to rising labor costs. So Phillips tested this relationship between wage inflation and unemployment, and stolen directly from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, um, this is what he found. So... We had periods of low unemployment with high inflation and periods of high unemployment with low inflation. And the idea was that, well, reading directly from this, lower unemployment rate means more people are working, signals that increased demand for labor. So as such, it puts upward pressure on wages. Companies raise prices for their products. But that inverse relationship that Phillips described has, quote, flattened in recent years, promoting debate among economists and policymakers. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the original formulation was purely statistical. And by that, I mean there was no economic theory in it. It was just basically here's a statistical relationship that I found. And, you know, that's going to be the case with a finding like this. You have a finding. There's the statistical finding there's the, the, the evidence that you find, right? But then you're like, okay, well, evidence without theory is garbage, so you need the theory. And if you find the evidence and there's no theory for it, well, you can do two things. You can either throw it away, or you can go, maybe there's something to it. How can we tweak the economic theory to see if this evidence actually makes sense? So eventually, economic theory was tailored to try to explain what we see, so originally it was pi inflation equals beta zero minus beta times u minus un, or the natural rate of unemployment that un. So it's deviations of unemployment around its natural rate plus some error. We tweaked it to get 
inflation equals expected inflation minus beta times deviations of inflation from its natural rate plus the error. So that beta zero became expected inflation. And we've talked about expected inflation already. So here's like a statistical formulation of it. And that beta, well, that beta is the relationship between inflation and unemployment, namely deviations of um, actual inflation from the natural rate, or actual inflation, uh, actual unemployment from the natural rate of unemployment. And then that epsilon thing is just the zero mean serially uncorrelated residual. We learned about that when we learned the vector out of regression stuff. So it's the same idea as that, basically. An alternative specification is to think of it not in terms of unemployment and inflation, but maybe output and inflation. Because, well, unemployment and output are really two different sides of the same coin, right? Like, you know, labor is a, an input in the production function. So if labor goes up, well, labor goes up, unemployment goes down. If unemployment is going down, labor goes up, labor goes up, well, that means output would be going up as well. Because remember, output is a function of capital and labor, and it's increasing in both capital and labor. So you could think of it as like an aggregate supply curve almost, where you've got y equals yn, or the natural rate of output, minus alpha times deviations of inflation from expected inflation. So y would be the rate of output, yn is the natural rate of output, pi is inflation, that e of pi is expected inflation, and that alpha tells me the sensitivity of output to inflation. All right? How, if you have a deviation of inflation from expectations, how does output change? So in this case, inflation will affect unemployment, which, well, I guess in this particular case, inflation affects output. And so these would be our two different Phillips curves. The first one would be the trade-off between wage inflation and unemployment. And the second one, the aggregate supply framework, is the relationship between inflation and the rate of output. So when you're looking at uh, inflation and unemployment, you're going to have a downward sloping Phillips curve. If you're looking at inflation and output, you're going to have an upward sloping Phillips curve. So the basic idea here is that high inflation means low unemployment or high output. And that was an interesting statistical and eventually economic finding. But, as is almost always the case, politicians heard about it, and they really liked it. I mean, if you're a politician, who wouldn't like it? Because if you have low unemployment, well, maybe you can tolerate a little bit of inflation. You know, reduce unemployment. And thus, if you have low unemployment, well, be willing to tolerate a little bit of inflation. Because, I mean, would you rather low prices and be unemployed, or would you rather be employed and have slightly higher prices? Um, personally, I'd, I hate to say it, uh, but I'd kind of rather be employed and have slightly higher prices. And politicians understand that, and they exploit it. Of course, they tend to exploit it a little too much. And here's the thing. So from really between like the late 50s until the 1970s or so, the idea behind the Phillips curve reigned supreme. And then we entered what's known as stagflation. We got this in the late 1970s, and it's a period of high unemployment and high inflation. But remember, when you're thinking about the Phillips curve, it's like high unemployment, low inflation. Low unemployment, high inflation. What happens when you have high unemployment and high inflation? Well, that's stagflation, and that sucks. And that kind of started to kill the Phillips curve. And then a little while later, we got something called inflation targeting, which really became like the final nail in the coffin. So let's look at the inflation rate plotted against unemployment from 1960 to 1969. So this is the period where it kind of worked. So uh, there's, it's in no particular like order or anything like that. It's not like, you know, you got 1960 here and then 1961 here. This is just kind of the ordering doesn't really matter. So I'm just sort of assuming, all right, well, you know, it's just these just I want to find the relationship. And you can see there's a nice downward sloping relationship here. And, you know, as you get further and further out and a higher unemployment, you do kind of get a flattening of the inflation rate. But in general, yeah, it's this nice downward sloping like curve. 
So that's between 1960 and 1969. So that's when it kind of worked. What about when it kind of didn't? So let's look at, say, 1969 to 2022. Do you see a downward sloping trend here? I don't. I see like a shotgun blast. At very best, you could say it's a flat line, but even then, I don't think so. It looks actually more like it's kind of upward sloping with a lot of stuff going on over here. So that doesn't really work. So it seems like from 1969 onward, it kind of stopped working. And then, well, between 1960 and 1969, it worked pretty well. Ew. Let's put them together. Okay. So this is when the combination of when it worked and when it didn't work. And you can see how it fell apart, how the Phillips curve really started to die, or at least when it started to die, and then how hilariously so it started to die. So it pretty much died in the 1970s. But there were improvements made on the Phillips curve that made it a bit better because it would be a little simplistic to assume there's like always a predictable relationship between inflation and unemployment because, well, what about including expectations into the model? Well, that like aggregate supply-esque thing I showed you was what's known as an expectations augmented Phillips curve. It makes the Phillips curve forward-looking rather than backward-looking. And this is where rational expectations comes in. And we'll, we'll talk about rational expectations a little bit later. But the idea is you don't look backward to formulate your expectations. Instead, you want to use all available information today to develop expectations. And as you're doing that, it becomes forward-looking rather than backward-looking. And I mean, think about it this way. If you're walking um, you know, in a certain direction, do you want to have your back in the direction that you're walking looking backward going, oh, well, okay, I've seen that, you know, the, the road hasn't changed yet. So if it's just been a straight road and all I'm seeing, you know, straight road looking back, then it's going to be a straight road going forward. It could be a turn. You don't see it. If you turn around and you start looking forward, you're going to see that turn. Same kind of idea here. Now, that's with the concept of like these expectations. There's another concept we can think about though, and that's that of sticky prices. And this is where we get into like a new Keynesian model type argument. It's that prices are sticky and they need time to adjust. Now, firms can either increase prices or they can increase outputs. If you think like supply and demand framework, prices can go up or output can go up. Now, I guess both can go up, but like if it's like one or the other, it's either price or output. So if you can't raise your price, well, you got to increase your output then. And you got many different interpretations for why there could be a short run relationship. So you've got like that expectations thing. There's like a signal extraction problem from Robert Lucas, which is that firms are going to produce based on their expectations or current expectations of inflation. And they can only produce more given more inflation if that increase in inflation tricked them into making more. So if expected inflation here is like 2% and then actual inflation is 3%, well, that deviation increases output. But it's only that deviation. And notice that deviation changes from expectations. So if you're expecting 2% inflation, but then you're like, hey, maybe I might actually be expecting 3% inflation, well, then a 3% inflation rate doesn't do anything. It's only if you're consistently expecting 2% inflation that 3% inflation can increase output. Now, that was one way of looking at it. We're actually going to get back to this particular setup later on in the course. But there's another framework as well, and this is the sticky price argument um, from the New Keynesian model, which we'll also be learning about later on in the course. And the idea is that prices are sticky in the short run. And not all firms can change their prices in response to a shock. So some firms can change their prices and some firms can't. So what would an example of that be? Think if you're a firm and say you're Subway. Maybe you guys remember that $5 foot long. I think I've talked about it in this class already. If I have, sorry. And if I haven't, hey, you learn, new, you learn a new thing today. Subway for the longest time had this $5 foot long thing. And, you know, any foot long you got was like $5 or almost any foot long you got was like $5. But if there's this huge demand shock and they've been advertising this $5 foot long thing for years, that's going to be kind of costly on their part 
to go, well, now it's a $6 foot long. Sorry, guys. People are going to get kind of pissed. They might lose some business. So in the short run, they go, you know, we might lose out a little bit, but we'd lose out a lot more if we changed our prices right now. So that would be like a sticky price. When there is a cost incurred in changing the price such that you go, you know what? I don't think I want to change the price right now. And that's what this guy is telling me. If you think of this kappa term at fancy looking K uh, as a function of, say, a share of firms in the model uh, that can't change their prices, well, they have to produce more to satisfy that increase in demand. Now, I mean, both of these are really, you know, excellent descriptions. Uh, my personal preference is like the New Keynesian Phillips curve. Um, it, I really think it explains this in a more rigorous and economically sufficient way. Um, and it also kind of lines up with the data in terms of inflation and like adjustment to shocks and all that stuff. Not to say that the signal extraction problem is entirely useless. It's just, you know, if, if I had to pick one, like which one's your favorite of these? Well, mine would be the New Keynesian Phillips curve, but we'll, we'll learn about both of these and you can kind of make up your mind as you go, uh, throughout the course. Now, Here's the thing. There's a short and a long run Phillips curve. Thus, there's two different Phillips curves depending on what the time horizon is. Short run. That's when there is a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. It's not always predictable, though, as we've learned. In the short run, it could be a signal extraction problem. It could be sticky prices. It could be something else driving changes in unemployment or output in response to monetary policy shocks. Because this is a monetary policy question. Do you want to increase... Um, asset purchases, or do you want to slow asset purchases down based on where output or where inflation or where unemployment is currently? Either way, you're observing real economic responses to these monetary policy shocks, which tells me there's at least some existence of the Phillips curve. Maybe it's not in the form that policymakers thought it was like, you know, 65 plus years ago, but it probably still exists. Um, and, you know, it would be kind of naive to assume, well, they got it right 65 years ago and nothing's changed. Well, things change all the time. So that's in the short run, though. In the short run, there is a trade-off, not always predictable, but there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Now, in the long run, though, there is no trade-off between unemployment and inflation. And this is consistent with monetary neutrality in the classical dichotomy. Right, so in the short run trade-off exists in the long run no trade-off so let's go with like the new keynesian phillips curve on this guy All right and this is that five dollar foot long thing that i was talking about with subway so there's a fraction of firms that can't adjust their prices you get this demand shock more people coming in and you go i'd really like to be able to change my prices but i'm gonna piss a lot of people off if i do it so maybe i'm not gonna change my prices just yet that's in the short run what about in the long run, a couple years from now? Well, a couple years from now, you're going to go, maybe maybe I can change my prices. Everybody else is doing it. And as more people start doing it, it becomes less awful to you if you do it, less awful for you if you do it. So eventually, you're going to go, you know what, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's not $5 anymore. It's going to be like 6 or $7. And in the long run, all the prices get updated in response to a demand shock. And then as such, when prices are updated, remember, price is a rationing mechanism. So the price can't change, output has to go up. But as the price can change, that rationing mechanism kicks in. And as the price changes, output returns back towards its like long run or its potential, where it was prior to the shock. Unemployment returns prior to or returns to where it was prior to the shock. So we have the Phillips curve here in terms of output and inflation. So we've got this positive relationship between them in the short run, but this LRPC, long run Phillips curve, it's vertical, right? This is right here. This is where the short and long run Phillips curves intersect. And you can think of this as like a long run equilibrium. So in the long run, all prices get updated. You end up with a level of output that's the same as what it was before, regardless of the rate of inflation, kind of like with what we saw with the impulse response functions in the previous lecture. And we get monetary neutrality in the long run, and it lets us revert to that classical dichotomy for analysis. Now, 
when it comes to the Federal Reserve, you've heard a lot about how the Federal Reserve operates. You've heard about their dual mandate before. Well, their dual mandate is actually just the Phillips curve. They want to promote stable prices and promote maximum employment or minimize unemployment. That sounds a lot like the Phillips curve. And if you think it sounds a lot like the Phillips curve, it's because it is the Phillips curve. So what gives? You know, I, I, I just said it was dead a few slides ago. Now, in the original form, yeah, it is dead because there's no predictable trade-off between inflation and unemployment. If you target an inflation rate of 5%, you're not going to get an unemployment rate of X percent every time. It changes. In the augmented form, where you consider inflationary expectations and assume a forward-looking framework, things can get a little different. It can start to show us some kind of a relationship. It might not be as tight as what we once thought, but you know we also haven't really exploited it at the point of death. So we could describe the dual mandate as, say, equation one. U sub t equals un minus alpha times pi minus expected inflation plus that epsilon t. So ut is unemployment. Un is the natural rate of unemployment. And then pi t is actual inflation. E of pi t is expected inflation. So it's deviations of actual, actual inflation from expected inflation. And the idea is you want to use announcements to guide expected inflation and then use monetary policy to set interest rates, which then sets actual inflation. And you want to achieve some rate of unemployment consistent with the relationship that you see in equation one. Now, this gives us a pretty interesting finding here. And it's that it's not really the inflation rate that matters, right? Pi t by itself doesn't matter. It's surprises to inflation that matter. It's deviations of actual inflation from expected inflation. So if the Fed is tasked with this equation right here as like their, their outcome for monetary policy, um, that's great. But here's the thing. According to Milton Friedman, the economy gets used to any inflation rate that you set. So you could have an economy with an inflation rate of 10%. Everybody knows prices are going to increase by 10%, and instead of interest rates at 3%, they'd just be like 13%. Now, of course, that's assuming like immediate response in prices and that there's no like, you know, really slow transmission mechanism of monetary policy, which we'll be learning about a little bit later. Um, but the point that he was making is that it's not the inflation rate itself that really affects things. It's surprises in inflation that would be affecting unemployment by that amount alpha. So that surprise in inflation, pi t minus e of pi t, right, that matters by an amount alpha. So it's not inflation that produces a stimulus. It's higher than expected inflation that produces a stimulus. So let's do an example here. Maybe the example will help you guys get it. So we've got this equation, and I'm going to assume the natural rate of unemployment, un, right? And that natural rate of unemployment is like what unemployment would be in the absence of any inflationary um, deviations or any shock. So this would be inflation deviations, and this would be shocks. So in, when this guy is zero, and when this is zero, ut equals un. What unemployment rate, or what the unemployment rate is in like a natural, not being screwed with sort of environment. Now that's 3%. Alpha is 3 over 2, or 1.5%. Um, pi in actual inflation is 2%, expected inflation is 2%, and that epsilon is zero. So that's telling me, all right, the natural rate of unemployment is 3%. Inflation is equal to expected inflation at 2%. So because inflation is equal to expected inflation, the economy is currently used to an inflation rate of 2%. So I plug everything in there. And that gives me an unemployment rate of 3%. So the economy is used to inflation of 2%. And when they're used to that, and they're getting an inflation rate of 2%, and there's no outside shocks or anything, the rate of unemployment is equal to 3%, which is the natural rate of unemployment. What if inflation and expected inflation were, say, equal to 10% rather than 2%? Would that have any difference? No, it wouldn't. Because again, inflation and expected inflation are equal. As such, you get inflation minus expected inflation. And when those two are equal, it's 10% minus 10%, which is 
and the unemployment rate is still 3%. So according to Milton Friedman, if we look at this Phillips curve, regardless of what the inflation rate is, as long as it's equal to the expected inflation rate, well, the economy is unchanged. But what if, say, inflation or expected inflation is 2%, and the central bank goes, we want to lower unemployment, like a lot. So we're going to raise actual inflation from 2% to 5%. Well, everything except for actual inflation stays the same. So everything that we had in these examples here is the same, except pi t is no longer equal to expected inflation. It's now 5%. Expected inflation is still 2%, so that is a 3% deviation. Okay, well now what's in those parentheses is no longer zero, it's, well, three. So you get three minus three over two times three. That gives me two and a half. So the unemployment rate is now down to two and a half rather than what it was here at 3%. So inflation today was above expectations. And because of that, well, then unemployment drops a little bit. But because inflation was above expectations today, right? that is now useful information for the public to be using tomorrow. So they're taking all available information tomorrow when they set their expected inflation for tomorrow. Well, they're going to go, okay, well, some of this useful currently available information is that inflation was 5%. It's probably still going to be 5%. So now they update their expectations to 5%. And the economy gets used to a new inflation rate of 5%. So what happens then? Well, the public is used to inflation at 5%. Now let's say the central bank doesn't want to impact unemployment in the next period. So they set inflation equal to expected inflation. Well, in that case, we now have expected inflation at 5%. We have actual inflation at 5%. And unemployment is now back up at the natural rate, which is 3%. So now, if the central bank wants to reduce unemployment below 3% again, they've got to increase inflation to be above 5%. So in period T plus 2, they want to lower unemployment again. But inflation or expected inflation is already 5%. So you need a higher than 5% inflation rate to actually get lower unemployment. So let's say it is 7%. You set inflation at 7%. Plug that into the Phillips curve. You want to get a new unemployment rate. Well, now you get UT plus 2 equals 3 minus 6 over 2. I don't know why it says 3 minus 6 over 2 equals zero, it's supposed to be three minus six over two minus zero. And now we have inflation of 7%. And I'm sorry, my brain kind of died there for a second. Uh, three minus six over two is definitely zero, because six over two is three, so three minus three is zero. So you have no unemployment, which is awesome, but you now have 7% inflation. Now that's not good. 7% inflation is pretty high. Um, now, according to Milton Friedman, as long as everybody's used to and happy with 7% inflation, that's fine. But when we play with this Phillips curve a little bit later, we'll see why it's not fine, especially for the central bank. And that's going to be when we get to a problem of time inconsistency. It's a game theory problem that you guys will play with a little bit later. So the thing is, Let's just assume for now, 7% inflation is too high. Central bank doesn't want high inflation anymore. They want low inflation. How do we get lower inflation? Well, you lower the inflation rate. But remember, unemployment is set around inflation being equal to, or inflation deviations around expected inflation. But we're expecting 7% inflation. If they want lower inflation, that's great. You can just lower inflation. But if we go back, back to we'll say just equation one over here right if you increase inflation above expected inflation well that reduces unemployment right 
This is a linear relationship. So if you increase inflation above expectations, unemployment falls. What happens when you reduce inflation below expectations? Unemployment increases. So it's not costless to stop high inflation. Let's work through the example. So central bank wants to cut inflation. Period T plus 2, inflation is 7%. And period T plus 3, that means expected inflation is 7%. Now they want to reduce it back down to 2%. So I'm going to plug that in for pi T plus 3. So I get unemployment equals the natural rate minus 3 over 2 times 2 minus 7. Whoa, wait a minute. 2 minus 7, that's going to give me a negative number. Uh-oh. Because then I get ut plus 3 equals 3 minus 3 over 2 times minus 5. Well, that's equal to 3 plus 15 over 2. Oof. That sucks. 3 plus 7.5. 10 and a half percent. So if you want to reduce based on the conditions given for this particular equation, if you want to reduce inflation from 7% down to 2%, in one period, well, you've got to tolerate 10.5% unemployment. That's not good. Now, you might choose to do it slowly, and, you know, that's fine, but maybe you just want to rip the Band-Aid off. Depends on, well, a lot of things. So um, there's <laughs> costs and benefits to doing it slowly or ripping off the Band-Aid. Um, so, you know, it really depends on what the central bank wants and how the public is expected to react. So if the central bank wants to lower inflation, they have to tolerate high unemployment. And that could be very bad for the central bank, again, because they don't want an unhappy public. Now, fortunately, in this situation, well, actually not in this situation, in all situations, Federal Reserve is independent. And they are independent because of things like this. An unhappy public with an independent central bank doesn't mean everybody at the central bank is fired. Right, they're not elected. The Fed chairs are not elected by the populace. Now, they're, they're nominated by the president, and they're confirmed by the Senate, but that's a little different, right? It's not going like they're, 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 their presence at the, uh, the Federal Reserve is determined by mob rule. It's, no, it's determined by, well, the president and the Senate. So there's still a little bit of a political process, and there, there's still some politicking that goes involved or that, that is involved with um, monetary policy and the government. So it's not entirely independent, but it's at least independent enough. And um, the thing is, though, right, if they want to reduce inflation, they have to tolerate high unemployment. Well, that does technically violate their dual mandate, which isn't good. And again, this will get... We'll get into this when we learn more about um, time and consistency in monetary policy. So we are coming back to this in a couple of chapters. But again, the Fed chairs aren't elected by the populace. They're not elected by the people. So it's at least a little bit, uh, there's a little bit of cushioning there. So, you know, as we've seen recently, the Federal Reserve has had to increase interest rates, which has put a little bit of pain on the economy, not quite as much as we thought. It's not the soft landing everybody wanted to engineer, but at the same time, it's not like this absolute disaster either. But if the Federal Reserve, the, the Fed chairs were determined by the public, well, probably would be, the public would be like, well, we don't like what you're doing, so you're all gone. That wouldn't be very good either. All right, so let's get into this rules versus discretion thing, because that's really kind of what I was beating around the bush with. The Fed's got a dual mandate. And so it means they've got to control both output and inflation, or really unemployment and inflation. But the thing is, there's a little bit of an issue, right? That lowest possible inflation rate isn't that 2% target the Fed mentions. It's 0%, right? That's the lowest they could possibly go. I mean, I guess they could go lower than that. You could have deflation. But let's assume no deflation, so 0% inflation rate. But they want to minimize unemployment, which means tolerating a slightly higher inflation rate. So this is kind of where, like, there's another function that we're not really seeing here that could be determining some of the fluctuations and the relationship, not the relationship, but the choices the Fed makes when selecting an optimal inflation rate. So we're going to learn about this a lot later.
But the thing is, sometimes the Fed might try to make things better and then, as a result, make things worse. Um, so this comes to the question, should the Fed have discretion to set inflation to lower unemployment, or should they have a rule forcing them to just simply minimize inflation? And in that case, they would have to not be tasked with minimizing unemployment at all. It's just maintain zero inflation. That's all we want you to do. Don't do anything else. Don't set um, an inflation rate to try to influence unemployment. It's just 0% inflation. Now, that's nice in some cases. In other cases, having discretion can actually be somewhat beneficial. Um, when the economy is doing well and things are fine, okay, 0% inflation is awesome. That works. But when we go into a recession, well, there are welfare gains should the central bank be allowed to step in and exercise their discretion to perhaps increase inflation to lower unemployment and lessen the, um, the sting of being in a recession. So that's a expanding upon that is for another time. So we learned a little bit about the Phillips curve. Um, learn about the relationship, like the short run, long run relationships. You learned about where it needed improvement. And you know, we got a few ideas on how to improvement and what some of them were. We learned a little bit about rules versus discretion. Um, and we also got Milton Friedman's opinion on it. So overall, I guess this is a pretty decent lecture on um, the Phillips curve. So uh, next, um, well, we're going to do some other stuff. I think we're going to do money growth and inflation. Um, Maybe you are, maybe, no, I think we actually did that last chapter. So maybe this was developed slightly out of order. My mistake. Yes, we definitely did uh, money growth and inflation in the last chapter. So next chapter, we're not talking about money growth and inflation. We're talking about Ricardian equivalence. Um, so thank you for watching. And later this week, we get Ricardian equivalence and how the government is just the kid that sits in the corner eating glue all day. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye.